So the panel organizers asked me to talk a little bit about the history of computers and writing scholarship in relation to digital humanities pedagogy scholarship. Um, to sort of outline what some of that history is and what's been going on in the field and then how that relates to my own teaching of digital publishing um, in, within an English department. So that's where I'm going to start. So the first bit of this presentation feels like a review for you. Um, I apologize. There'll be some little nuggets along the way that I hope might be of interest to you. So what I'd like to do is situate digital writing studies, uh, which is the area that I'm going to be focusing on the most in relation to um, rhetoric and composition as a field of study um, and technical and professional communication as a, an overlapping but separate field of study within an English department that has literary studies and creative writing as well. Um, the history of retcomp and of techcom or professional communication both involve um, heavy, uh, a heavy emphasis on making. And so I know that's one of the key terms in digital humanities. Um, and so I want to trace what that history of making looks like within writing studies. Um, I'm going to segue here for just a moment and talk about, um, show you some of the terms that might be useful to you as I go through this presentation. Uh, there is a journal called Computers and Composition. Um, there is a conference called Computers and Writing. Um, both of these have lowercase versions that signal the name of the field, respectively, uh, and another transitional term that's also used for the field. Um, and then there's some other terms that are also used for uh, digital writing studies or computers and composition interchangeably um, with some minor variations um, as you go through. Um, okay, I'm going to zoom back out to the main. Okay, so I'm putting these three areas in conversation with each other um, in true Venn diagram <laughs> fashion. All right. In order to really situate the timelines between computers and writing scholarship, what, what I'm calling computers and writing scholarship, um, also known as digital writing scholarship, with digital humanities scholarship, I want to show you the timeline of rhetoric and composition here, uh, which has since the 50s focused specifically on pedagogy as one of the major research outcomes from that field. Of course, the introduction to computers came later, and I'll get to that in a second. But some of the pedagogical approaches in composition studies, for a long time, rhetoric has been taught in American um, colleges of higher ed. It started in Harvard in the 1800s, brought over from a tradition in Scotland. And as a pedagogical approach called current traditionalism that focuses mostly on gatekeeping. The idea was um, that there were uh, too many middle class people coming in after the Industrial Revolution to institutions of higher learning and rhetoric classes, which then turned into first year composition classes, uh, were a method to get their grammar up to snuff, so to speak. Uh, so that, that tradition is um, currently poo-pooed by, <laughs> by um, mainstream rhetoric and compositionists, although that tradition, as you can see, continues um, well into the 50s and certainly is practiced in a lot of schools up into, uh, through today. But I'm going to fast forward to the second half of the 20th century, where we begin to see in writing studies um, this notion of writing as a process, which was very revolutionary in relation to current traditionalism, uh, thinking that Writing was something that you needed to, to learn through multiple drafts, through revision, through review, peer review, that sort of thing, and that students actually had a, their own voice that they could add. Um, so the beginning of, of expressive writing in a lot of ways came out of the 60s, um, where uh, movements such as students' um, rights to their own language uh, were created by organizations like the Four Cs. Writing as a process is one of the biggest staples in writing pedagogy these days, and it continues into digital writing pedagogy as well. Um, we also get student-centered uh, student teaching where, you know, out of um, Freire's work, uh, the teacher is no longer the authority in the classroom, and you see all sorts of processes including collaborative writing, peer review, and introduction to critical theories in the 90s, and multimodality in the 2000s up through the current and current um, research today involving genre studies and activity theory. I'm not going to detail all of these, but what I wanted to point out mainly was that 
Writing Studies Scholarship has been doing uh, work on collaboration in pedagogy that we've been writing about in our peer-reviewed scholarship since the late 70s, that we've been talking about writing as a process, as an iterative process since the 60s, that we've been talking about shifting teacher authority into student authority since the 60s, um, and we write about all of this in our scholarship. It's a very long tradition of this. Okay. Now, to focus in a little more closely on computers and writing, um, I've just chosen some, some key dates uh, for you, which you certainly may not need to know, but I'm just going to put them in context of um, some stuff that I know that's going on in the digital humanities com community to give you a, a perspective on why, as, as some of you may know, I tend to get a little grumpy whenever anybody <laughs> from digital humanities say, says, oh, digital pedagogy, it's this new thing. And I'm like, no, it's not. We've been doing it for 35 years in computers and writing. So here's why. <laughs> some concrete evidence on, on, uh, on that you can place as to how we've been doing this uh, work for a while in computers and writing, which, um, as I'm hoping to show, is a subset, an indiscipline of rhetoric and composition. Uh, so the first article um, that's labeled as being in the computers and writing field was published in 1975, uh, the first dissertation in 1979, um, the first conference followed quickly by the first print journal, peer-reviewed journal in the field that's incredibly well known uh, in, in 1982 and 83 respectively, and then the software samples, um, I want to point those out in particular because for me they function as a precursor to that camp, um, where pedagogy has become one of the big issues at that camp, accompanied by there's all this technology and tools out there and, and software and hardware and like how do we use that with our students in the classroom to really invigorate their learning. This work has been going on at conferences like NCTE and 4Cs um, since 1984. Okay. Uh, and then followed, of course, by uh, in 1986, the very first Computers in Writing Intensive Classrooms Summer Institute called CWIC uh, that we ran for 20 years at Michigan Technological University and then Cindy Self, who's the founder of that institute, transferred it with, with her um, professorship to Ohio State University where it's now run as the Digital Media and Composition Summer Institute. These started, like I said, in 86. They're really precursors to, uh, or forerunners to um, the Digital Humanities Summer Institutes very well known in the computers and writing field. Okay, and then of course in 1996, um, my favorite, Kairos, <laughs> uh, was started along with two other online journals in rhetoric and composition to focus specifically on web-based publishing, um, publishing web text that can't be produced in print. Now this does follow postmodern culture, which started in 1990 um, as a listserv, basically, um, or an email distribution, um, but they're no longer open access, unfortunately. So However, Kairos and CNC Online, which is still publishing, are both continue to be open access, which is nice. Okay, so we jump forward a little bit, and based on my work with Kairos, I've been with that journal since 2001, um, I've formed what I'm calling an editorial pedagogy, and it's this combination, really, of uh, the workplace practice pedagogies based out of technical and professional communication and those making practices and writing as a process practices of rhetoric and composition. Now combining that together with um, genre studies and activity theory, um, this editorial pedagogy um, helps me work with students in a way that asks them, uh, that encourages them to write, write for real audiences, which the New London Group would call giving students a situated practice within to work, work um, by offering them overt instruction which gives them very specific ways of understanding how, that, how an assignment that they're designing or composing or writing or whatever verb you want to use um, fits within this real world scenario of, of writing to communicate and then framing that in such a way that allows students to be able to understand the bigger purposes of it so that they can transform their practice and use their learning to learn, their learning to write, um, learning to design outside of the singularity of that one classroom and in other writing situations. Okay. So I'm drawing on the New London Group's pedagogy of multiliteracies, which has these four frameworks 
in its pedagogy when I'm working um, in what I'm calling digital publishing studies. Okay. Uh, for me, digital publishing studies situ is situated again at the intersections of RETCOMP and TechCom and um, creative writing and literary studies, specifically focused on um, media studies. For instance, I work right now within, um, at Illinois State University, we have a publishing studies undergraduate sequence that works at these intersections where students take a couple of classes in rhetoric and technical communication, a couple of classes in creative writing, and a couple of classes in um, like history of the book and media studies and stuff like that. And then they have two specific classes that are um, focused only on um, the uh, praxis of publishing. And one of those is the classes that, that I teach. Um, I teach several classes in that sequence, but one of them that I want to um, briefly talk about today to finish up my round, portion of the roundtable is the professional publishing class that I taught in the spring of 20, uh, 2011. Now, within that class, um, and you can find the syllabus for this online, I have tried to model the New London Group's um, frameworks for a pedagogy of multi-literacies um, by asking students to write, uh, excuse me, to mine metadata from the entire history of the journal Kairos. Now, if, if you're not familiar with Kairos, um, let me say briefly that we only publish web texts, which we define as open access, multimedia rich pieces of peer reviewed scholarship that can only exist for screen based, on, with screen based consumption. Okay, so they're not um, print things put online. Um, they are interactive scholarly websites. So, Kairos has been publishing since 1996. Uh, we had over 25,000 media elements, I think, um, across over 1,000 web texts, uh, or which is our equivalent of an article, that we'd published in the history, but we didn't have any metadata <laughs> on any of this, um, these pieces. But we were trying to build this new content management system using OJS, um, and we needed to have data to put into the database. And so, as part of what I asked the students to do in this class, I wanted them to mine metadata so that in part they could learn about things like open access, digital scholarship, peer review, tenure processes, publishing practices, and of course metadata. So the, the, invert, the overt instruction that was happening in these, um, these themes within publishing studies were reinforced not only by the theoretical readings that we were doing, but also by the major project that I gave them, um, and which I <laughs> wrote 200 pages of instructions that helped them walk through all the different ways of gathering this metadata and mining it from um, the front ends where they would have to read rhetorically and understand the context of how a GIF fits within the framework of um, an individual web page, as well as within the website, um, for instance, or They'd also have to read behind the scenes where they were looking at um, file structures and directories and counting um, file sizes and writing down URIs and keeping track of um, which authors published what titles in which, which issues and things like that. So there was a lot of overt instruction happening in, with that particular um, assignment or that project. Now to frame this for them, um, we would often have in-class discussions based on the readings that we would then tie to in-class practice. I'm a big proponent, as I'm sure many of you are, who do um, digital pedagogy assignments, of having students work in class whenever possible. I have taught things like this online, um, and it's possible to do that within discussion forums, depending on what your you know, class size is, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, but being able to constantly situate for students, why are you doing this assignment? Why am I asking you to mine this metadata? Uh, what benefit does it have for you um, as a student, for you as a researcher, for you as, um, as a potential employee of somebody who might eventually hire you to do this kind of work? And as well as what good does having this metadata do for readers of Kairos and for um, scholars of digital scholarship? Um, and for scholars of the history of peer review and things like that. And so we'd have these grand, you know, very nice grand discussions um, and then we would get to work in the latter half of class 
um, filling out you know URIs and, and file sizes and things like that. Um, and then of course the transformed practice is where I say, okay, you've done this project for Kairos as students. How can you like what have you actually learned? What processes of composing, what processes of design, what editorial processes have you learned that might be useful for you when you go out to work in, you know, a library, in a publishing house. A lot of these majors, uh, they were all publishing majors who took this class um, and they were all seniors because it was the senior level publishing class that they were required to take. And so most of them had, um, had their sights set on uh, getting a job and getting a job in publishing, in editing, in writing after they graduated. Um, so asking them to write final reports where they could articulate to me what they thought the best practices in mining this data were, um, for them to be able to make suggestions and recommendations based on their own experiences in really a project that no one in the field had ever done to this extent. And, and by in the field, I mean in rhetoric and composition, in technical communication, and as far as I know, I could be wrong, but also within DH communities, asking 15 students, undergraduate students, who aren't even rhetoric and composition majors, who have no idea what Kairos is when they walk into the beginning of the semester, to be able to write best practices by the end of the semester, uh, I was pretty impressed with their work, I have to say. <laughs> they worked their tails off. Um, and then I was very pleased that we could do a, a shared um, poster session at um, the New Media Consortium the summer after that they did, they did this project. So uh, that's one very small snapshot of how I'm, I'm using this whole timeline of writing pedagogy and collaborative pedagogies and feminist pedagogies where we're looking at things that are, have yet to be, you know, have not been brought to the fore yet. Um, and doing that all within a, a digital pedagogy context um, that I'm drawing on these 30, 40 years of digital pedagogy as well as the longer history in writing studies behind that. Um, but I think dovetails nicely with what DH is trying to do with the concepts of making, um, you know, hacking versus yakking as we say, right? Uh, anyways, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be here today. Um, I'm in Norway on a Fulbright, <laughs> um, so I hope that you will be able to tweet me uh, and let me know if you have any comments or questions and that this gives you a little snapshot of what we're doing in computers and writing. Thank you.